All right, before we start this episode, I just want to say, what's up? <laughs> what's up? How are you? How you guys been? Uh, we have a great, great podcast episode today, um, kicking off the season with the one and only, my Canon collab brother, Rory Kramer. Rory is a a savant. He is a visionary. The dude's a, a super, super creative. I've been following Rory for, for a ridiculously long time. It's actually crazy. I feel like our paths have been running parallel with each other for and have such similar structure and so it's crazy that we've never like crossed paths until now um but i'm I'm happy that we have thanks to canon for making that happen um he's such a good dude and i think that the story that he shares today on the podcast is a real one like he talks about you know his come up but also you know you have things like his highs the highs of like working with justin bieber and having the uh the ability to shoot his cover art for his album and then the lows and challenging yourself and dealing with depression and and anxiety and fear and all the shit that comes with this creative industry that we're in. And so he he really opens up and gets real with him with, with us on this podcast and I appreciate him for doing that and I'm so glad to have him as our first guest this season and uh and, and yeah, so thanks Roy for coming on. If you're if you're new here, if you don't know what Black Widow Cream is, I'm my name's Ben. I'm a creative. Uh, I started this back in 2016, and it's two things. It's a podcast where we can share ideas and great stories like like Rory's, but it's also a creative community where people can come together and share their ideas and provide value and share their work and um, give tips and suggest things and and provide work opportunities and jobs. Um, it's a, it's a really cool network that has been flourishing and we got members from all over the place. And if you haven't been in it before, if you if you have heard about it, if you don't know anything about it at all, you should sign up today. You should join our community. It's it's like a dollar for 30 days. Come try it at least. Um, BWNC.com slash join. We would love to have you in there. It's it's a uh, it's it's inspiring me every day to see the things that people put out. And it's only gonna get bigger, especially when we get you in there. So sign up for that. If you haven't uh, subscribed to this podcast, do it on whatever platform you like. We have a lot of amazing episodes about to come out over the next several weeks um season two is a banger our guests are ridiculous so yeah i think we just get into it thanks to canon for setting us up black window cream's back let's get it ladies and gentlemen this man here may be just as famous as the artist he works with <laughs> he's very well known it's rory kramer what up guys how you doing thanks we, for uh, having me yeah dude no thank you it's early it is. I, sh I, sh I pulled you out of bed, made you come up here from Long Beach. I thought we were going to start earlier, so I'm, this is this Yeah, is we nice. adjusted. It yeah, felt better? Did. All right, yeah. good. I know. I needed to give you some time to fucking enjoy yourself at the hotel <laughs> and shit. How you been, man? You been good? I've been doing well. Doing yeah. real well. Excited to be back out in California. Uh, my wife and I relocated to Denver back in January. Yeah. So it's always nice to come back and visit a place you've been. How like how was the move? I, I also just moved to Iowa, ran. Okay. Um, but like moving out of LA, you lived here for like what, how, 12 how, years, 12. Yeah. How, so I how moved it, here when I was 25 and then, um, uh, just, I was starting the justice tour with Bieber yeah. and, um, I knew I was going to be gone for a long time and LA at the time just really wasn't the safest. And so I didn't feel comfortable going and doing what I loved and leaving my wife like kind of unsafe at, yeah. at home. And so. I was like, we should move wherever you want to be during this time. And so she wanted to go to Denver and I was like, I think Denver would be sick. So that's dope. That's where we're at right now. And had you ever lived there before? I have not. Oh, I've nice. just been there for tour and stuff and skiing. How do you feel like for the, I mean, I guess you probably haven't spent a whole lot of time. Have you spent much time there? No, the last few months has been the most, uh, since tour got postponed. What do you like the most about like getting out of the city and the adjustment of being in that city? That I don't really know anybody. You and like I, that? Yeah, I like, because I feel like here for like 12 years, it was just a constant, like seeing people um, everywhere you go is just, I don't know, I just feel like now I have like a little bit of space and I can just kind of like check in with myself and mm -hmm. like see what I'm interested in. Because I feel like we were talking earlier about getting burned out and yeah. I feel like out here you can fall into those cycles and burn yourself out and where... Now in Denver, I feel like I'm like rediscovering certain things that I like to do, um, certain creative things that like I'm like inspired about now. Oh, that's so, dope. Yeah. What what have, what have been some of the hobbies you've been picking up out there? Um, well, I got back into golf a lot. Um, love that. Um, Can you golf in the mountains? In the mountains? Yeah. Do they have like golf courses up in the mountains? Yeah, I think they got them tucked away in it's there. Kind of I don't vibe. know right now, but <laughs> um, I think they do. Yeah. 
But um, what else have I been up to? Been doing a lot of painting. Um, then I just finished up my yearly, like, I make a coffee table book. So I've, I've done for the last three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I made uh, one uh, for the chain smokers as a Christmas gift, like, two years ago. And then last year I made a Bieber uh, coffee table book with all the photos from the Justice album shoot. Damn. And so, because they weren't going to live anywhere besides, like, my hard drive. So I made a coffee table book, gave it to him as a Christmas gift. and That's sick. Yeah, I made, love made myself that. one. Yeah, yeah, nice. How many photos were in the book, you think? Several hundred. Jeez. Yeah, it's it's like a thick book. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. That's so dope. Yeah. I, I think that's always cool. I always try to do that with different artists I've worked with too and stuff, and I think it's like, it's just a cool way to like really make your thing a physical item or yeah. whatever and go out of your way to do that stuff. But you, when you talk about burnout, I mean like, bro, you've been living here and grinding. Like the story is ridiculous, right? Like I've heard your story many times from various places. Big Thank fan, you. by the way. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you've you. been crushing it. And it's weird because there's so much parallels with us. Like, yeah. yeah, just from hearing, you know, you on other shows and I listen to stuff. It's like, there's so much playing music, all that stuff, trying to figure out how to make it, like grinding, going back to living in parents' house. Like I did the same shit, you know what I mean? And I think what's cool is like the idea of being vulnerable enough. I mean, obviously you left with a really good purpose uh, to for like safety and it made sense, but like it's not easy to leave this area because of all those like stigmas of like, you know, if you leave like Oh, trust me, I went through all you. that. Yeah, yeah, did you? Like, yeah, my wife, she's like, are you sure this is the move? Like, And I was like, you know, like, I hope I'm established enough that I can like start to work on things that I want to work on and not have to feel like I have to keep grinding. Yeah. And like, it's like, what is the end goal? Right. And like, why am I grinding so hard? And so, yeah, there's a lot of that doubt and like uncertainty about are artists going to want to work with me? But, you know, Denver's a solid, like, music scene got red rocks there so yeah. there's a lot of artists that are always coming through and like i've gotten to see a bunch of my friends like on tour that have come through and it's it's awesome they're like oh i forgot that you live here yeah. this is sick <laughs> yeah so that's cool and also that's what i keep saying plans were invented for this reason so we could fucking be where we need to be in like in a couple hours you know what i mean it's like the worst airport in the world though denver yeah it's like four hours from the city i know i don't get that yeah it's very I weird i don't know how i'm you know we can kind of go through, there's parts of your story I know you've told a million times, mm -hmm. but what I think is so cool is like hearing the the early grind and obsession with like, like just really living a fulfilling life. Like you in the late, you had the lake, you had, that was early before it became cool and that kind of stumbled you into like finding Final Cut and all this shit. I'm curious about like kind of the, the friends that were around you at the time, were any of those people like gravitated towards the film side of things or did it happen to just be you just because you always were running a gun with the camera it was pretty much me well in high school i made these uh like kind of like it was like a jackass film like cky kind of stuff um where it'd be like a lot of skateboarding a lot of skits and just anything and everything with my friends but uh i had a friend that like basically we were kind of like three of us were like partners on it like making the video and uh i shot pretty much all the time and then like my other friend, he shot a lot on camcorders. Uh, and then I taught myself how to edit. And, um, but like with the lake videos, as I got older, I was always the main like videographer, but I also wanted to be in the videos. So I would literally put a camera in my friend's hands that doesn't know how to do it, show them how to use it. And then they would kind of feel like they were part of it and they got to like, they enjoyed it. And so people yeah. would, Hey, I'll film today. Right, right, right. It's my turn. Yeah, yeah, So it's cool. And then every, like, especially with, the, like, making those lake videos growing up, like, when I was in college, when I first started making uh, Gangs of Clear Lake, Clear Lake Chainsaw Massacre, all these, like, horror films at the lake that were mixed with, like, water stuff. Yeah. Um, my friends would just come over every night after we would go riding, shooting, and we'd just watch footage every night. It just like awesome. running it back on the raw yeah. stuff, like everything like yep. that you guys have created. I think that's like probably the most gratif gratifying piece is like just hitting play and everyone reacting to it, right? Yeah, I, that's what really sold me as far as like getting into this. Um, Cause I remember growing up, I had two older brothers, older sister, and I was a lot younger than them. And like when they're in high school, they're like, you know, they're the cool kids, whatnot. And I was a lot younger and it was, impossible to get their attention mm. and that's when i discovered like my mom's video camera like oh my god i can record myself shooting a basketball off the roof of the house and making it and it might take me you know 40 tries but i got that one captured and now i can like 
play it for my brothers. Right. And it, that's like what you were saying is like you hit that play button and it was just like immediate gratification. Yeah. It was, it was so cool to like, I was like, wow, like I can hold people's attention. And these are people that are a lot older than me that don't really aren't necessarily interested in like what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then it was like, okay. Then I noticed I'd have like a couple clips to show them. And then it was like, okay, I got to make a whole video. Yeah. And then yeah, I made my first video, brought it into homeroom at school and I was watching it with like oh. a buddy. And all of a sudden I looked behind me and the whole class was behind me watching it. And they're like, can I buy one of these? I was like, yeah, five buy bucks. It? Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause I, it's like I slinging DVDs and tape. Yeah. Uh, it was uh it? it was a data cd Hell so it wasn't yeah. even a dvd yeah, yeah, yeah. so you it was basically like a memory stick you put the the cd in your computer <laughs> and then you drag it onto your desktop and if you had one of those cheap apex like uh that walmart sold on like black friday yeah, yeah, the yeah. dvd players the cds would actually play on those dvd players oh, it was crazy yeah. yeah yeah and That's like so everybody nuts. in my town had them because they were like 30 bucks at walmart yeah, one year yeah. so what you just started hustling yeah i sold CDs? i sold nine the first day made 45 bucks and i was like my friend and i were like we're gonna be rich dude <laughs> ended up making 500 bucks on the video God damn bought a second video camera so i could like have two angles of everything and then it just started turning into like all my friends would show up after school and we would just record anything and everything it'd be like oh you got an idea okay and then was this like at your house like where, where yeah. was like the, the where were my parents at work it was they're all no. at work and you're just like in the out there out just the, yes would yeah. you guys live like it was it like your backyard was to the lake or what's what's that no so i grew up in a town in southern indiana mm -hmm. um and then we had the lake we'd go there in the summers and then when i got in college my parents like retired and now they live there okay full -time. nice so then when you were like in high school at that point how were you editing because i know you talked about later on you like got access to final cut and you were like yep. found a computer but how were you doing it back then so i had um uh, one of my friends that i was in a band with his older brother like always had the latest and greatest gadgets and he had um an old sony vio desktop mm. and he had just bought a, a laptop and he said I could borrow the computer to learn how to edit. So I learned how to put a firewire port in there, all this stuff. The computer was 9.5 gigabyte hard drive. Like, so like imagine you're trying to think like, how could you even put anything on yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. But like mini DV tapes, like when you'd capture them on there, it was like so small that, yeah. um, so basically I bought this program you lead video studios okay. from best buy for like a hundred bucks taught myself how to edit my friends would come over and just watch me every day after work or every day after school and we would sit up in the attic for hours and they're just hanging out while you cut yeah and like there was no like google there was no youtube to like hey how do you import video yeah, like yeah, yeah. now you just put a, a memory card in the side of your computer and you know you dump it whereas back then i would have to rewind the tape play it find the clip i want Capture. Press, press capture yeah. and then it would come on and you'd have to either capture the whole tape by itself then you'd have to go through and scrub and find your clip or you'd have to what i did was like i would import each clip and it took forever Man, oh my but, God. <laughs> but it, it, it taught me a lot of discipline and now like i feel like since i grew up in that time like a lot of the mundane stuff that i have to do like organizing stuff it's like i feel a like i'm breeze. ahead now yeah, yeah a breeze you were used to managing like 220p videos trying i have to i have a shoebox in my closet like at my parents that's just stuffed with tapes mini dv tapes oh, I know. yeah i just uh, i was uh, telling someone about this the other day I, I i had them too like holiday i think last year i was like man i need to get these digitized and my girls, she's like, my girl's little sister's like 14. So we started a whole little side hustle called rewindthetimes.com. And Love now she's that. just starting to, to digitize tapes. I was like, do all mine. And then I'll start telling people back What'd home. What'd she charge? 20 bucks a tape, any amount of time. Some people got six hour tapes. Okay. But it, they might also have five minute tapes. All right. So sometimes they come up real. I want to get my parents uh, all their old VHSs digitized from yeah. like when I was a kid. Yeah. Because I got one digitized like last year for this CD video I was doing. And it was so cool just seeing old footage. That's crazy. Yeah. Like I was going through a time warp looking at stuff from back in the day. Like just because you, that was, you know, Jackass was like the pinnacle. Everyone wanted to be like that. We're like, you know, trying to like put duct tape on your shoes and run in the snow and like slide into bushes and stuff. <laughs> and you just thought you were so tight. You know what yep, I mean? Yep. But I do remember the same. It was always that idea of like, 
you know, making this and then showing it's like the show and tell aspect, which I don't, I don't remember how we even started distributing it, but I do remember being able to play like tapes at school for people and like everyone could watch in the class. And I, I, I've 100% understood that like satisfaction part of it. But then yeah. when you decide like, all right, cool, we need to make more of these. You started theming out videos. Like, is that when you started talking about like your chainsaw mass, the, the massacres and like, well, we I just, uh, it was just, so I made my first video when I was a senior in high school mm. and then I went to college. Um, well, I made a second one, a follow up to that first one before I went to college. And then college was like really difficult for me because I went from a small town to a big school, Indiana University, and I was the only person from my high school to go there. Oh, wow. And so I didn't really know anybody. And where, you know, growing up, I knew the kids I went to high school with since grade school. Right, right, so right. like I had uh, these long, friendships built and then when I went to college it was kind of hard to fit in because I was into different stuff that you know the mass majority of people weren't into right and so you know I was the geek with the, the video <laughs> camera and like eyeliner on yeah I was, I, was, I was super into emo oh, I was an emo yeah. kid we just got done with an emo cruise we, yeah. like literally like last week we were just out there with all these emo bands it was like the coolest shit ever that's where at uh in the ocean bro like on a cruise line going down to Mexico it was like Whoa. five days, um, like Newfound Glory dashboard, under all the bands, all the bands. Sounds like everybody from Drive Through Records, Just straight up. Yep. It was, it was <laughs> like the coolest awesome. shit. So was that at the same time that you were doing making these videos and like it was more stunty and like I know you were like really into water skiing and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming a lot of it was also shooting that just for action, like the action sports side of it, right? Yep. Like a lot of those videos. So we're at the same token. You had had your band. Were you like? Did the video element kind of play into like you being like, oh, we should record our shows or record our sets or anything like that? Um, no, uh, I never really filmed a lot with the band. I think I got into another reason I got into video and I like what attracted me to it was I wasn't great at making music, like performing and whatnot, but I, I was obsessed with it. And mm -hmm. so once I found out that you could cut to music and the beat, I was obsessed mm. and like, sorry. No, um, so then it started off like I would edit to the beat and I'd get good at that. And then um, then I started editing to like the vocals and just kind of finding, just like experimenting and playing around. It was so new and so just exciting that like I got obsessed with like, I think being into music originally helped my like just love for videography and editing and, well, you know. and like the focus too like i feel like it helps you understand what from a musician what did you play uh bass you're playing bass so as a musician on your side like obviously i don't, I don't know if you were like performing and sort of like blowing this up and shooting music videos and stuff but no, we weren't that good right but from a band's perspective you knew someday we could be that good. Yeah, yeah yeah and then in that mindset you would know like what you would want content wise you know what i mean from a yep. creative standpoint which then obviously brushes off on the work you started doing later on in life but were you when you were in that like grind zone where you were by yourself and you is, is that the time that you started picking up like final cut and you started really like learning editing software i picked up final cut when um sophomore year of college they uh it was final cut seven yep um the classic the classic that was awesome did you get the book there's like a book to learn it instead of tutorials no, no? so no I, I just i found this computer lab at iu that was always empty i don't know oh what classes they ever had in there but it was just I had like key keyboards with the or not like a musical keyboard yeah. they had all these gadgets with all the and all the macs in the in the lab where were the nerds I, where's everyone <laughs> i know right <laughs> so i um would go in there and i think at the time i was making uh this lake video called project mayhem kind of based loosely off of fight club okay word so um, all of those videos at that time were kind of like had killing and like murders, like because it was real easy to film and <laughs> yeah. like write those skits. Yeah, and so um, so we were always killing each other in the videos. <laughs> so, anyways, um, I taught myself on that video project mayhem how to like import on Final Cut, all these things, and I there wasn't Google, there wasn't YouTube, so I literally would have to hit file. Well, what does this do? Yeah. What does that do? Right. And then occasionally somebody would come in making their rounds to check the lab, the lab. And I'd be like, hey, do you know anything about Final Cut? And it's like, well, a little bit. And I was like, well, can you show me this? And then like every, like I just asked people 
or I would just have to figure it out on my own. And I taught myself how to make this whole video on uh, Final Cut Pro and yeah, it was just, was there a teacher? Was it? Was there any classes for it? So the class you communications, right? Yep. Yep. So same. the class that I wanted to take, you had to be, you had to take an entry level class first before you could get into the class where they'd teach you Final Cut. Right. Right. So I just went and taught myself, and so by the time I got into that class, all the kids were like, "How do we do this? Yo, man, like your stuff looks like it should be on MTV." And it's like, <laughs> hell yeah, that's right. crazy. That's yeah. <laughs> Then fast forward, yeah, yeah, my, I, know, I have that, a TV show. Yeah, what the fuck? Yeah, that's surreal. Is it? Is I remember like getting. I got Final Cut. I finessed a teacher to give. She was like a. She got like student, because she was a teacher. She could get access to the, the software to like test it with her students, and I like, like, put her in a corner. And was like, yo, you gotta give me that. Give me those discs. I need that shit. Like, and I remember getting Final Cut for the first time and just how surreal it was to have access to it because like, this is how i'm gonna make movies it's crazy it's crazy to know that program but then to not i don't think people understand how difficult it was to learn something back then where now you literally just go anything is like a two-minute video on youtube that'll teach you how to do it yeah and, and also i think um oh, what was i gonna say about it um shit you were final cut teachers final cut um mtv no it was final cut dang it i don't remember I threw it off no what were you saying well, what I what I was thinking about is like I think the reality is the time that you spent early on and what you were putting in, which is so interesting to me because if you're at the school but your friends That's what it was what was it? Um, it was just so expensive to get the program. Now, like you pay like you know a monthly thirty bucks. Yeah, and you get the the program. Back then, it, I think it was like fifteen hundred bucks for the program. Yeah, couldn't afford that. Hell no. So the only time I could edit would be on school computers. And then when I got older, I had this job and my boss was like, yo, just take the final cut home. And I was like, well, it's not going to work because it's the same serial number. And he's like, well, just don't turn on your internet. And so basically my boss gave me like my, my first copy so of, sick. of final cut and the hand-me-downs. Yeah. Love that shit. Cause like I couldn't afford 1500 bucks. Bro, no, it was no crazy. Way. Yeah. I remember they had an Apple film festival and the, the winner would get Final Cut and even Mac Pros or whatever they had at the time. I don't remember what the computer was, but I was like, dude, if we just win this contest, our lives will change. You know yeah. what I mean? But impossible. I think uh, when you were going to that school and you're by yourself, so all your homies are still back at the lake, like you're still shooting these videos then? So I had not met all those lake friends yet. Yeah. Because I would only go in the summer for like a week here, a week there. And then when I was a freshman in college, that's when my parents like moved there full oh, right, time. Right, right, right. Like, well... They'd spend the summers there. And uh, my dad was like, hey, what are you thinking about doing this summer for a job? And I was like, I don't know. And uh, he was like, well, I think you should get a job at the marina on the lake, you know, cleaning boats, pumping gas. And I was like, all right, I'll think about it. And he goes, I think it would change your life. You know, um, I remember when I came up here as a kid, like it really changed who I was. And he wasn't joking. Like some of those people are still my best friends. I was texting with them last night, this morning. Um, yeah, they, it, the lake ended up becoming like a huge part of my life and who I am and yeah. established a lot of friends, how I met my wife. Yeah. It's crazy how, yeah. my, how, uh, many ties it has to like your life now. And yeah, that was that. So are you saying that that time period when you started working there, that was like summer jobs while in college? Yeah. So, so I would be pumping gas and then all these kids that didn't have jobs that are now my friends, yeah, they would roll up like 10, 15 people in the boat they would get on the dock and you know, there's cute girls in the boat. And then I'm like, who are these, who are all these guys? <laughs> and like one guy would come out with like 20 ice cream sandwiches, tossing them to everybody. The and he's plug. like, Hey, you pump my gas. I have an extra one. Do you want it? And I was just like, I think we're, we're going to be best friends. <laughs> yeah. And he's literally one of my best friends to this day. That's crazy. His name's Taylor. And, um, but yeah, they, he had the, Taylor had this barn about a block away from the Marina. And they had these two quarter pipes, so it'd be like a half pipe, and they were skating. And my cousin was like, yo, you need to go over there and like make friends with these people Like, if you want them to be in your movie this summer. And I was like, yeah, I need to make that movie. So I go over and there's like, I think it was like, it's like a five, four, five foot um, high quarter pipe. And I, I don't even, I pull up, get out with my skateboard and there's like, five, six guys, don't even introduce myself. I go up to the top of this uh, half pipe and I just proceed to run 
jump off and try to acid drop and I just eat shit on it, the concrete. Into the, the, just from just the land flat, uh, not dropping in, just running, <laughs> jumping to the flat ground, yeah. and putting the board under me, trying to um, land it. And I just eat shit. And these guys are like, dude, this guy's crazy. <laughs> and I was just like, what's up? I'm Rory. And like, I'm trying to make a film this summer. You guys want to be in it? And then we all became friends and yeah, the rest was history. You literally pitched that. That was like you pitching them. Like, yo, can we, I, I'm here to make a movie. <laughs> Basically, I was just like, yo, like I, I make videos, I have a video camera. And one guy's like, oh, I do too. And I was like, you do yeah, not. Right. Not like me. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. I was a little cocky back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Because nobody did that. Right. Like now everybody's a creator. And back then it was, just, you know, nobody really did that. Right. So yeah. then when you would be like shooting the movie and working on this stuff, you still have to go back to school to be able to like cut it? Um, or at that time, did you start getting access to? I think I think I got a a MacBook Pro. I think I bought one from a guy, like for a couple hundred bucks, like off him. And it, I don't think the keyboard worked. Right. It was some. There's something. Or the trackpad didn't work. Yeah, yeah. And so I had to get a mouse to plug in. So <laughs> just adding, like off this broken computer. Yeah. So you start doing all that, and everything starts to expedite. But at a certain point, like you know, when did you feel the bug for LA? Like. When did you feel like, okay, I'm here, I've been doing this, I'm in school. Did you finish school? I did. You I graduated. Um, you went to Florida at some point? Yep. Then uh, that year, I moved with a bunch of guys from the lake down to Orlando because I had dreams of being a videographer in the wakeboard scene right. and making those kind of videos because I that's what I was doing with like the Clear Lake, Clear lake Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. I'd make like these wakeboard videos, but it would have like bits of acting in it. Right. So right. like I was... I don't know. So people would show off like actual tricks, but then play. Because I like, also wanted to be an actor at the time. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, dreaming big. Yeah, so I would you know cast myself as the lead role in all the films. <laughs> uh, but I, I never was the murderer. I, I no? never no. Yeah, want to pull the. There's trigger. my buddy Michael Hansen. He was always the killer. <laughs> always, always the same guy. It's always <laughs> once a killer, always a killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. I don't even know where I was going. Like, with it, I but. mean, to, you were do, you were shooting these videos back then, and then wanted to move to Florida, like aspire. Yeah, to, like, so do that. so I got into the wakeboard scene. I called up this guy Scott Byerly, who's mm -hmm. like one of he's the godfather of like the sport, and I wanted to work for his company, Volume Wakeskate Videos. So you got wakeboarding where you're attached to the board. Wake skating's like skateboarding; you're yeah. not attached, and you do it on the water. And um, I was obsessed with wake skating it's what i do every day after work like in the summers and then i got pretty good and so moved to florida and i just called up back then like you could google P or you could just look in the like look up on whitepages.com yeah and i found this guy scott byerly his number and i called him and i was like yo is scott there and his wife's like no like can i take a message and i was like well my name's rory like i want to work for like volume wake skate videos and they're like Wait, what this is so bizarre. Like they'd never had anybody just like randomly call, call them. them. Their and house so, phone. Yeah. Holy so shit. they ended up um, going to lunch with me at like Panera and I showed them some videos and ended up hanging, like becoming friends with this guy I idolized. <laughs> and I would just show up at his house and like they were always calling me to film because like I was always free and I was always down. And so. I started hanging out with all these pro riders that I idolized and all my friends were like geeking out because we all idolize these people. And so I worked on two of those videos, um, got to edit a bunch of sections. It's like a skate video essentially, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but for water. Right. And um, after about a year, I had another job where I worked on a flow rider down in Orlando, one of those artificial waves you can surf on. Okay, word. And so, I had that job to actually pay my rent and then the wakeboarding job, the filming, it didn't pay. Like his company didn't like make enough money to be able to pay me. So he would just pay me in like all the gear he got for free, like That's from sick. his sponsors. Yeah. So like, you know, after like several boards, I was like, I, I need some money. Yeah. And so I dislocated my shoulder on the flow rider job and needed surgery. So I moved back to Indiana. I was 25, living with my parents in the basement, had about two grand in cash in a shoebox. And, and a bunch of wakeboards. Yeah, and I was like just uber depressed, and like I was just like one of those negative Nancys that was just like, oh, nothing's ever gonna happen to me. Like I don't want to go work at the news. Like I don't want to like shoot for, like, like 
jobs don't yeah. didn't exist like what they are now. And uh, um, so, oh God, I'm spacing out. Uh, no, you're right on it. I mean, you're literally yeah. sitting there t- questioning your life. Yeah, so I was <laughs> super depressed and I was dating this girl and she was just like, I don't like you anymore because like all I would do is like, oh, my life sucks. Yeah. Like nothing's gonna happen. Like who wants, like, oh, woe is me. And like, who wants to be around that? Yeah, and so yeah. she broke up with me and then I was like, oh, I gotta get out of here. And so I hit up some guys I went to college with and I was like, yo, I'm definitely coming to visit you guys in LA this year. And he goes, just move, move out here. We got a room opening up next week. And I go, yo, dad, what do you think about me moving to California? He goes, I think that's a great idea. I'll drive you out there. And he drove me every single mile. What a champion. Yeah. I think he was ready to get, get me you out, out of the house. basement. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, wherever the hell you got to yep. go. But what were they doing? Like your friends from college, they were in LA trying to do anything in the inner Yep. Industry? They'd moved out here after college okay. where I'd moved to Florida. And so they were kind of established. They had this three-story house they were renting in the hills. What? And it, like, yeah, exactly. Like I was how, like, wait, what? How are they? St- what happened? How I, they- like, there was, I think, six people living there. Okay, and they're, like, so paying yeah, a grand a easier. month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I... I mean, when they told me like your rent's gonna be eleven hundred, I was like, "What the hell?" I just went from college where I was paying three twenty five a month to Florida where I it was five hundred dollars a month, and I thought that was yeah, like yeah, yeah. gonna just be the end of me. Then it was a thousand. I was like, "Oh, and where you am I gonna get this?" In the yeah, box. I was like, "Where am I gonna get this money?" Yeah, and so just start grinding. So when you got dropped off, like when you got out there, obviously like the water sports and stuff you're kind of, what are you leaving? Like leaving it behind to an extent? Like you're like a going to bit, LA. Yeah. So I, I, until then I'd spent five or six summers at the lake. Mm-hmm. And so um, I didn't know what I was gonna do. And I that first summer when I moved to LA, I came back to the lake for five days and I made a video called like a summer in five days. So I tried to pack everything in, in those five days. Right. We were just filming sun up to sun down. And then, Every time I go home in the summers, whether it was a week, a month, I'd always try to make a video. And then one year I just titled it Lake Life. And it was like a 15 minute video. And like I sent it to a bunch of friends and they all like hit me up and they were like, yo, I gotta be honest. When I, when I saw it was 15 minutes, I was like, ah, I'm not gonna watch this. And then all of a sudden the video was over. They're like, if you held my attention like for 15 minutes and it was like, I was like in it. Glued. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so I got a lot of those kind of responses and I was like, okay, I think I got something here. And I started getting a lot of traction on the internet from like just random kids I didn't know. They were like, I love these videos. And so- You're putting these on YouTube at yep. the time? Okay, word. So, and I think it got like 100,000 views and that was a lot for me. Yeah. And so then I made part two, chopped up my car into a convertible with my friend. And um, that one did even, had more success. And then, so I was just like, all right, guess I gotta make a trilogy. And then made the third. And then I was like, well, I go home every year for 4th of July. That'd be cool if I made part four, like yeah. the fourth. Yeah, yeah, the and fourth. so Smart. then it was made part five. Then I got married and I was like, well, I should make like part six, Rory's the last rodeo. And so, <laughs> just kept yeah, going. so I just kept going. And it, it was just, they were so fun to make because it was like all those videos my friends and I had made when I first met them. Now I feel like they were kind of polished. They were you know, actually entertaining yeah, and people were gravitating towards them and everybody on the lake was always wanting to hang out with us. And my neighbor would be like, hey, you want to build a slip and slide on our hill? And I was like, sure. The like, whole time, like- The whole time was just like wanted in the videos, That's wanted so to be a sick. part of it. It was awesome. And it, it just, you know, the community we already had there helped just really strengthen it and tighten right. it. And- um, Before you put it, like before you- like the people that you didn't know started talking back in the comments and stuff like that. Were you the original goal? Like when you're always like, Oh, I need to make a video. I need to make a film. Was it just like at that point, early YouTube where you were like putting up, but just circulating within like the school and the friends, like the homies like that. Um, like why, what gave you the drive early on before you really got, cause there's like this, I was in college and I remember YouTube became a thing. Yeah. And I, I wanted to have a TV show since I was like 15 and like, that was a dream. So I was just like, Oh, maybe I can get, recognized on YouTube. So I, I mean, I put my unlisted videos on YouTube is yeah. ridiculous. Thick. Like you'd be like, Oh my God, he made those kind of videos. <laughs> like I'd have like impersonation videos where I would try to like 
I'd be quoting all movies oh and God, like, I guess, yeah. there's anything and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have an acting reel on there from like 10 years ago when I lived in LA. It is, <laughs> it's so bad. It's good. Yeah. yeah right. Right. The acting is horrible. Some like, shit Tosh.0 would have probably yeah. like, grabbed. Yep. Did you, w the people that were in the house at that time. So like, cause now you're still, go you're, you're in LA, but you're going back to make your thing that was like, well, I, I would just go home to see the family like yeah. once in the summer. And, right. And then when I made the lake life video, that was, I was 29 that summer and, um, 2012, something like that. Yeah. To me, I was like, Oh cool. The thing that is starting to show success is back home. Like yeah. you're leaving LA and going back home, but those were just for like your breaks and you were taking advantage of it. But those things started to like blossom and you yeah. started to get some traction. So, so I made, so I made the first lake life and then, um, on my 30th birthday, I put my two weeks in to quit my full-time job so I could pursue this career I'm doing now. Yeah. Uh, an artist, Blau, Justin Blau, he had um, reached out and asked me to go on tour, and I went, and he was like, hey, I want to take you everywhere. And I was like, well, I got no more vacation, so I'm going to have to quit. Yeah, yeah. And so I did the math in my head, and I was like, you know, I can work like five days and cover my rent working with this guy. Right. Then I got 25 days left of the month to make my videos right. and keep pursuing my dream. And so I remember quit the job. Uh, I got served in a lawsuit. I, what? yeah, I just, I, yeah, I, I made part two. I quit my job, drove my car across the country, cut it into a convertible, made part two, came back, like was still uncertain if like I was gonna be able to like financially survive on my own. And this guy walks up to me, he goes, you Roy Kramer? I was like, dude, I'm getting recognized. And he goes, <laughs> You've been served. Damn. And so basically I got sur I got sued for something that I didn't do, but they thought it was me oh. because I had posted a video from the same kind of time. Right. And these people were like, oh, it has to be this has, guy. Yeah, yeah. And so it wasn't. And I luckily was able to like prove you know, it. Yeah. Oh God. And um, anyways. <laughs> I thought I'm getting recognized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine. You're like, do you want a picture or something, bro? Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, when I got served, I was like, I was like, did I make a mistake? Should I like, should I have quit my job? I was like, I like, I have to get a lawyer now, and like that cost me like five, ten grand, and I didn't have it. Oh my god! And so it was just kind of like, it was a scary time. But I remember make going home for seventeen days to like shoot that Lake Life two, and once I got that one made, I was just like, Confidence. I got something here. Like mm -hmm. you know, people like the Lake videos, like essentially got me and Bieber to bond to like, we were flying to New York and Scooter, his manager had already seen my like videos. And he's like, yo, show Justin the lake video. Uh, or wait, he, he wanted me to show him a picture that was on the background. It was my nephew and I on a tube on the water. And I was standing, taking a selfie while the boat's moving and everything. Yeah. And he's like, show him the picture. And I was like, I was just show him the video. So I bring up Lake Life 2 and we're watching it and there comes the scene on 4th of July where everybody goes to the island and just goes get, off. Goes off. Yeah. So there's a clip of me where I'm like, we're blacked out right now. We don't even know where we're at. That's where we're at right now. And like, <laughs> he goes, Scooter, this is real life, dude. He's like, I gotta go. This, this video is sick. So lo and behold, two weeks later, we're in New York and uh, playing video games, 6 a.m. I've already pushed my flight once and he goes let's play again and i was like dude I, I gotta go i only get so much time with my family i love the lake i was like you saw that video i was like i i gotta go i can't miss another flight right and he goes all right call Corey. tell him i'm gonna go with you i'm gonna go pack and i'm like what and because I, I my mom was like hey if justin wants to come to lake he's yeah, welcome yeah. to come to lake so up. so i'm i call my parents and i'm like hey so surprise i'm coming to the lake and they're like oh you got us. And yeah. I was like, yeah, that was going to be the surprise. Like I told him I wasn't coming all this. And I was like, actually I am coming and Justin's coming with his security guard. And they're like, just the Justin you work with. And I was like, yep. And so he shows up at my house. He actually gets there before me because the flights got all mixed up, whatever. So he gets to my house before me and my parents are like, when I get there, they're like, 
he, he's just sleeping down there. Like, we, we, you know, <laughs> we didn't, it was so crazy. And then all my friends come over and we're all out in the boat and like one of Justin's songs comes on and, uh, or my buddy puts a song on and Justin's like, Hey, do you like this song? And he goes, I wouldn't play it if I didn't like it. Yeah. And Justin's like, dude, your friends are dope. Like, like they're, they're like, they're just real. Yeah, 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 right. And so, yeah, the, I feel like those Lake videos really helped my career in the sense of um, just being social, like being able to like connect with other people, people like seeing my videos and like reaching out and like saying this inspired them. It just like, it was really a big confidence booster and it allowed me to just really yeah, become confident in my own work. And I knew that like I had something and like the the likes were more than the dislikes and the comments were all positive. Right, right, and right. so that just really encouraged me to like take that risk and keep doing what I knew in my head that I believed in. Whereas a lot of people would be like, oh, that'd never happen or mm. this or that. And yeah. so, and that's when people say that it's, it's pretty easy to get discouraged and like, you know, make, yeah, you know, I like I, I know. they're probably right. Right. You know. Yeah. 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 Like, um, well, and I, so I think it's cool too because it seems like the that was original to you. Like obviously, hella inspired by like some of the goats. Yeah. When it comes to like extreme sports and being able to like do pranks and shit, but like it was a piece of content that you started curating for yourself. Like at, you were obsessed with having the camera, you were obsessed with editing, you were obsessed with getting reactions, but you were even though you could, you know, you started working with other artists at that time and you were working for them, you would still make these for you. You know what I mean? It wasn't for any other purpose, but what's hilarious is like by doing that, then they ended up being like all the top people are like, yo, these are sick. It makes Justin want to go experience it. You turn it into a music video. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, you start, did you say you met your wife there? Yep. You like fell in love there. Yep. Like this lake seems Got to be like there. this really solid rock for you foundation of yeah. like creativity. The fountain of youth. That's crazy. The legit. Le real one when you when you were i you, you said something about um how uh on that boat like when you were playing bieber's music and shit and he was playing some new stuff and then uh you ended up taking like you started playing chain smokers music yep that's like insane to if you truly think about how you were this gatekeeper to already a talented artist but chain smokers weren't chain smokers and somehow you were able they're the selfie guys at the time right and then all of a sudden you you're putting them on to bieber to a point where he start like i mean then he goes and plays with them and all this shit but you led that yeah it was crazy i think one of the craziest things about that whole experience was um i think justin was able to see like honest reaction to music from like all my friends it was like one in the morning we're out in the middle of the lake and he just played the whole all the purpose demos for all my friends and they're all like wait, what is going on? We just heard an unreleased Bieber album, stuff that probably won't even come out. And so Justin's like, pulls the Augs cord off and he's like, you wanna play anything? And I was like, well, I like my friends always send me videos like jamming to Roses. I was like, I should put Roses right. on because I'm assuming Bieber wants to like have a good time, whatever. So I put that song on and my friends just start raging and he saw it for what it was. And he's like, I need a song like this on the album. And so then I played the don't let me down demo it wasn't out yet and he goes who's this and i goes same guys chain smokers and he goes it's a different singer i go that's the thing about these producers like these dj producers they'll get whoever to sing on their songs and so then we went to new york and um he just kept playing roses and then he did that infamous video where he's like singing over the drop about stealing me from the chain smokers and um he goes send that video to him and i was like all right and i sent it to him and they're like holy shit, can we post this? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you can post it, but you have to send me a video of you guys singing, what do you mean? And they did, I wish I could find that because it's so bad, it's so funny. Like they're- That never got posted? Not the video that of, of them the singing. Of the singing it? But Bieber yeah, yeah, yeah. singing over it. And then, um, yeah, then we were, uh, I think we were in Greece and I was playing their song, Setting Fires, and that wasn't out yet. Mm -hmm. I basically had all the Chainsmoker demos and I was playing it and then Justin did a Snapchat and I was like, Gr oh crap, dude. And he goes, what? I go, that song's not out. And he goes, oh, oh my bad, I'll, I'll delete it. And then he's like, let's call them. He's like, I, I should, we should help them out. And then a few months later, we, uh, he's like, what are you up to tonight? I was like, oh, the Chainsmokers are playing at the shrine. I was gonna go to that. He goes, I'll go with you. And I was like, 
okay. So I was like ready to roll. So I hit up Chainsmokers tour manager, uh, Clancy, and I was like, yo, I'm gonna be coming uh, with Bieber tonight. Don't tell the guys. We're gonna be rolling up. We'll have probably like, this would be like all the crew, whatever. And so we walk in, I walk in the green room and Alex and Drew are like, what up? And then Bieber walks in, they're like, shut the fuck <laughs> up, what? And so we were just all hanging out on the bus and Drew was like, do you think Justin would like come out and like do a song? And I was like, ask him. You're right. And so he's like, yo, would you be, would you be open to performing a song or two? And he goes, dude, this is your night. I'm just here to support. Like, I don't want to like take anything from you guys. And Drew was like, dude, we, we'd be honored. And he's like, all right, cool. Can you play Where Are You Now? Can you play? Like, like he, had his, he, he, already, he already had the set, set list yeah. ready. He knew he was coming to yeah, perform. Yeah. Right. So he's like, yeah, can you play the Marshmallow remix? And so, yeah. and when he came out, it was just, it was crazy. It was like one of those things where it's like, I helped facilitate that. And it, it really made me feel good about just like, because when originally what happened, I was... I did this tour where I met the chain smokers and I was waiting on my offer from Bieber's team. I'd already met with them and they were basically just like, well, Justin just needs to meet you and he'll tell like you. to work with them. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I'd already met management, whatever. And so um, during that time, like waiting for to meet Bieber, like it took like three or four months before I actually randomly was at Ultra when he came out with Skrillex and I just happened to capture it and I sent the video to the, the team, his team, and they were like, can we post this? I was like, yeah. So he posts it and then he's like, oh, I want that guy to be my videographer. And they're like, oh, well, we've been trying to have you meet him for like three, four months. But during that three, four months, I met the chain smokers, became friends with them. We hit it off right away. They invited me to stay on their tour bus on that tour I was on for five days. Um, they ended up asking me to go to Japan with them in June that June to film, they showed me the song Roses and they're like, hey, we want to make like a like a music video to this. And at that time, like the VG The Nights was out. Right. And when I first met the Chainsmokers, like I was chatting with Drew and I was making a, a post for the video hitting 50 million views. And he goes, he goes, what are you, what are you posting? And I was like, oh, I did a video for a VG The Nights. He's like, wait, that's you? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, holy shit. And he goes, um, and he started talking about this other videographer and he goes, dude, I think next year is going to be the year of the videographer. And he wasn't wrong. Like ever since then, it's just continued to go up, up, up. And I was like, dang, like, and like I, I think aspect? that's what, like what aspect, like in the idea. Cause that like everybody, like music was huge. Everybody wanted to be a musician. And he was just like, con like he just saw that content was going to be this next big thing. Mm. And it was. And Cause the fact that music video that you did, budget wise was it was it like a was it like a, a traditional music video which one for the avici one no so basically i got um i got this random email from this kid and i thought it was a prank because i was like no way is avici wanting me to make a video right. i was like you know i use his songs in my personal videos and so um i was like he he gave me this whole pitch i'm a big fan of like music videos that have a story and your videos, you know, I've been wanting to reach out with the, to you and work with you, but I haven't had anything. Now I got this song with Avicii, here it is. And I was like, well, it does sound like Avicii. <laughs> and I was like, I wrote him back. I was like, yo, whatever, like, whatever you need, man, I'm down. Yeah. And it's like, didn't hear anything. And I was like, for like a month. And I was like, told Damn. you, it was yeah. like some effort messing yeah. with me. And so then I get this random call and he's like, yo, what's up? This is Nick, Nick Furlong. Um, so Nick Furlong is the guy that wrote in, sang the song with okay, Avicii. Word, word. So he's the singer on it. And so he calls me, he's like, yo, sorry about this. I just got back from Sweden, just finished the song with Tim. And I'm just like, wait, this, okay. This, this could be legit. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, so I sent, he goes, I took one of your, your Lake videos and I just, I ripped it and I put the song over it. Didn't do any like editing, just straight up put the song over it. And I was like, can you send me that? And he, um, he's like, yeah, I'll send it to you. He goes, I showed it to Avicii's team and they were like, well, if you can make something, uh, you know, like we'll watch it. And so, but at that time they were going to go in another direction for like a music video. Right. So Nick calls me and he's like, yo, man, we can really do something here. Like he goes, if we can make something, they said they'd watch it. I can get in front of them. And so I was like, huh? I was like, well, send me that, that rip you did. So he sends me my, 
lake video with the song over it and i was like dang this kind of goes together and it's like not even like synced up yet and i was like if it's synced up this is gonna be crazy and so i was like give me give me a week let me put together some stuff so i went through all my hard drives started just collecting all these just banger clips and so i had all this footage that was like never in a video so right. i was like oh this is perfect and then i took from all my big videos just these big staple moments like lake life 2 i took the chopping of the car into a convertible I took right. that out because everybody loved that yeah, so i yeah. just stacked this avici video with um the greatest hits yeah all my greatest never hits before seen footage and so i sent it to them and they were like we love this like um how do we make it more avici and then then their emails are like, should we put live concert stuff? And I'm just like, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not saying anything. I'm just yeah. like, I can't believe I'm this far. And so well, you were turned off by that idea. Um, like you didn't feel like it was, I didn't feel like it was going to mix well. Right. And so then somebody on his team was like, no, nah, that's, that's going to take away from the video. And I was like, cool. Yes. Like, yes. So I was like, give me, give me a week. Let me, let me figure out something. I have some ideas. So I went and shot like a section of the song where I was like singing the lyrics. And it was like, in Philadelphia, in New York, in LA. So it was all these different places. And then it was, um, uh, where is it going from? Singing the lyrics. Singing the lyrics. So I, I, to do the, I, to... I wore, I got like, I made an Avicii shirt with his logo and I did some like stunts in the shirt. And then I put his logo on like this house and I shot some stars, star trails. And like, so I, I incorporated his logo in there. Um, and then I did the the intro scene where I went in this garage and spray painted all this stuff and voiced it over with a quote from my dad mm. and sent it to them. And they're like, can we buy this? And I was like, oh, you're gonna, yeah. I'll give you this. Yeah. Like, and so, and that was like my first legit, like big artist and like contract. I like. I had to like hit up my friends that were like managing like Martin Garrix, my friends that was managing Corella and like, I was like, yo, I need advice. Like what? How do I do I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. And so um, I didn't didn't even try to negotiate with them. I just took the offer Whatever. that they gave me because yeah, I was yeah. just like, I don't, I'll do yeah, it for free. Yeah. And um, the like video my, blows and up. So, so my buddy, Nathan, who managed Corella at the time and ended up becoming my manager for a period of time. He was like, yo, Rory's got the new Avicii video. And I'm like, dude, shut up until it's on <laughs> Vivo. Yeah. Like YouTube, shut up. Right. Cause I was like, cause when I first moved to LA, I had these, uh, those impersonation videos. These are still on my YouTube. So I did a Rob Deerdeck one. Okay. And everybody in the comments were like, oh, you, this is fake. You're just like, like lip syncing to like, his voiceovers and i was like no so i made another video where i did the impersonation and i was reading all the comments that these kids were like dude you this is you're just playing like the audio from the video like you, yeah, this. Yeah. and so i started doing all these things <laughs> and so i get hit up by mtv the producers of fantasy factory and they're like hey we want to have you on an episode and i'm like i made it yeah here we real. go like I'm gonna be hanging out with my hero, yeah. and so I'm telling all my friends, I'm gonna be on Fantasy Factory, dude. Like this crazy, tell them the whole, sh whole shebang. Right. They call me and they're like, "Hey, we're actually gonna go in a different direction." And I was just like, "That ha painful feeling." So then I have to tell all my friends, like, "Man, it's not happening." So that's like what I told my friend Nathan. I was like, "Until the video's out, like I'd learn my lesson the hard way." Like you know, everybody's like, "Oh yeah, sure you were. Like, yeah, you're gonna be on there." Yeah. And then. But a funny, like, full circle with the Rob Deere deck. Um, I tried to hustle him for a meeting when I moved out here. Mm -hmm. And, like, went to, like, found, Google mapped, found his house, would go drop off stacks of these T-shirts I was making, handwritten letter, like, I'd love to intern for you. Not, like, waiting outside his yeah. house, but I would drop it off and then, like, leave. Never heard anything. End up running into him at this party. And I was just like, yo, dude, what's a guy got to get it? what's a guy got to do to get a meeting with you and he's like bro like three of my people stop and talk to you and like you act like you're not there to meet me and i was like oh shit he knows who i am Wait, what do you mean uh oh so uh, this would help 
So <laughs> for a solid week, I had this cardboard sign that said, I'm not homeless, I'm just looking to network. And I positioned myself down by the Fantasy Factory where I wasn't right out front, but like I was this way that only way you could get there was going down this road. So yeah, I was yeah. like a little further out where I was like, oh, they won't think I'm there for them. And it was obvious. I'm like head yeah. to toe, Rob Deerdeck clone. And so as people stop and they're like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, just looking to network, man. And they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And so finally, so I asked Rob and I was like, well, I asked him that question at this party and he goes, um, three mile people stop and ask, like ask what you're doing there and you act like you're not there to meet me. And I go, well, in my defense, or like, in my defense, I, I don't want to be but, a weirdo. Well, I, well, <laughs> I don't like, I don't want to put all my stock and chances in that person's hand. I go, if I'm getting a no, it's going to come from you. I was like, I don't know what you're like, if I, if you're like, Hey, what are you doing down there? I'm like, Hey, I'm trying to meet Rob, like beat it kid. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like, I didn't want to get a no from somebody. I wanted the no to be from Rob. So he was like, look, dude, I'm a busy guy, but I'll have you down sometime. Like, I don't know when, but I'll have you down. And so, <laughs> so I'm like, ge I'm that. like geeking out and yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. And uh, never, never get invited down. So I'm working with the chain smokers and they're doing an episode of ridiculousness. And so Alex goes, yeah, I already told the producers that uh, our videographer has like a Rob Deerdeck impression if they want to use it. If not, like you're coming in that green room and I have to see you do it in front of him. And I'm like, God, oh <laughs> shit. So I, I dig up, I go watch my YouTube video and I, I get about 30 seconds worth of material. So like, if this happens, I was like, you know, I don't brain fart. I'm like, I'm dialed in. It's like, this thing is the sickest cat call ever. <laughs> so I have this whole like thing and I'm like practicing. And so now I'm in the, the in their green room and I'm like pacing and I'm like, oh God, like, is he going to remember me? How like, far apart? This is probably let's say thirty two, like seven years later. Oh, okay, shit. Like so a there's while. Been some time. Yeah, right, right. So I'm like, this is this is either gonna go one way or the other. And so the door opens and I hear Rob talking to some producers and he's like, You okay? And then he walks in, he's like, What's up, Alex? What's up, Drew? What's up, Rory? <laughs> and I was like, Oh God, he knows. <laughs> he remembers. And so he goes, yeah, like my producers come in and they're like, yo, Chainsmokers boy Rory so has good. like a, a Rob impression. And he's like, Chainsmokers Rory? Wait, like Rory from like seven years ago on the street sign, like on the side of the corner with the street sign, the, the DC hat and the rogue <laughs> status, like that, my Rory? And I was like, oh my, my God. Rory. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> he goes, so now you're filming for the Chainsmokers. Like what else is up? Yeah. And before I can even start a sentence, Alex goes, well, he's uh." He films for Bieber. He's got his, uh, he's getting a TV show coming out. He's like, what's the concept? So I tell him, I was like, yo, it's just like, you take the, every day, I, I film a music artist and then the next day, whatever city we're in, we go do two crazy things and get them out of their comfort zone. What's the network? I go, MTV. And he goes, fuck me. <laughs> he missed and it, shot. He was, I saw in that yeah, moment yeah, yeah. where he was like, if I would have took that meeting, yeah. maybe I would have saw something. Yeah. Maybe I'd be a producer on this kid's show. Damn. And it was, and so afterwards I was like, yo, I'd love to still have that meeting with you. Yeah. And he was like, yo, here's my email address. Oh, cool. And uh, I emailed him, he emailed me back and it was like the coolest, I need to get it printed and framed. Right. It was, he was like, yo man, like getting a show greenlit into air is like winning the lottery. He goes like, your life's gonna change forever. Man. And you know, we only did one season, so it wasn't like it drastically changed, but like it did. And it gave me so much more, like, just, uh... Bro, it was one of the biggest things, like, especially creator community-wise. Like, for everyone that knows what you were doing, especially like how, how they said, yo, it's going to be the year of the videographer. And, like, to see people actually start to build platforms and have some sort of, I don't know, existence in a place where they could share their thing and be appreciated and shit. But then for you to go and really unlock the thing that we all grew up watching, but only like celebrities got that or whatever. And then you'd be able to actually have that going to development. That shit was wild. It was crazy. And like the craziest thing, I'm gonna stop the podcast real quick, just, just for a second to talk about the illest thing I've ever done as a creative. And in my opinion, that was start the Black Window Cream community. Creating like an online place for creatives of all walks of life, whether you're just getting started or you've been doing this for 25 years, for everyone to be able to come into a safe space and connect with each other has just been, so motivating. 
I see people share their ideas, provide tips and tricks. They're offering job opportunities. If people are getting hired, they're connecting, they're building friendships, like real authentic friendships um, by just being in this creative space together. It's such a cutthroat industry. And I feel like we're always just pitted to be against each other or to try to flex on each other all the time on social media and stuff. But this is not that. It's the exact opposite. The walls are down. We're all just with each other, like as if we were in some massive coffee shop, just shooting the shit. So if you haven't joined the community, I highly suggest you check it out, bwnc.com slash join. We would love to have you in there. It's a dollar for the first month. Um, come and say hi. We'll, we'll see you in the community. All right, let's get back to this podcast episode. So MTV that year like went through, they just cleared house, mm. everybody. And they brought in an all new staff. And it was something like 13, 13, or 15, 13 or 15 shows got canceled and mine was the only one that stayed. Wow. Yeah. So that was like that's before it aired. Yeah, like they were cutting. And so I, I was like, man, my show's gonna get canceled. And like till it aired, like we didn't know if it was like we we're like, when are we getting an air date? When yeah. are we getting an air date? And back to the Rob thing, like yeah. he was like, um, he um, he did like a forty five minute call with me one day. I was in New York, and I was just like, yo, man, I'm like getting all this like like button heads with like the producers over at MTV. Like I just don't think they get the vision. He goes, dude, like let all the small stuff go focus on the big thing. Like the more you can put your name on the project, the better. And then that's where I got like in the title sequence of the show when it says Dare to Live, underneath it says a Rory Kramer vision. Mm. And so that was like a big thing like and it, it made sense. It was like focus on like nobody's going like nobody's going to remember if your hat was green or black, right, like you right, know, like right. focus on like the bigger picture. Yeah. And so that was very helpful. And then I love that. But with the whole show like getting it I think the best thing for me was it showed me that you can do anything, anything you set your mind to. And it's like, yeah, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. But right. it's like a lot of people told me like my dreams were stupid and like that messed me up a lot. And um, just like getting to that finish line and like seeing your show come out and like, it was like, I did it, yeah. you know, and it, it it reassured me that like your opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion might not even be right. Um, you might think you're right, but like it just like really just it was like when I like in the early days when I had like started teaching myself how to edit. Um, it just it built that confidence in me, yeah, and it was man. just like if somebody doubts me now, I know in the back of my mind, I'm like that's not going to bring me down. It's not going to ru ruin me because it might not even be true. They might be jealous, they might have their own issues. And so it allowed me to kind of have a new confidence, allowed me to look at things differently. So yeah. Dude, shit, thanks for sharing that. That's <laughs> for some real shit right there, but it's Hell so yeah. true how many, think about how many people's dreams get crushed all the time because they let those naysayers get in there and get in their head and deter them from staying on track or whatever it is. And there's perseverance in the way that you stayed your course. And yep. you know what I mean? It might not have always made sense, right? And that's the problem with, uh, I think, the fear throws a lot of people off because you could have never predicted this path. Well, actually, you kind of did because I think earlier in the interview you said, like, yeah, I always want to have an MTV show, and you really did, and that's pretty wild. <laughs> it, it's crazy. Manifestation. It it's is. It's a real thing. But it is putting your head down and just staying focused and how, how many doors it can unlock. And also just, like, the ability – like, you cold calling the, cert, the, the, um, the dude in Florida. Scott, yeah. To be able to get this person to just be, like, okay with talking to you to just sit there and have like a drive to be like, Rob, dear dick, we'll do whatever. And then Rob said a line to you that then made you think like, oh, I need to attach like my name to the show and I need to focus on like these huge key moments, but came from your, you just being like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm just going to ask for help. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And like, that's such a great takeaway. I just loved it so much. Just like creating, I loved everything about it. Like I wasn't, when I first started making videos, it wasn't for the paycheck because I wasn't making any money. Right. And I, like the views when they start going on YouTube were, if I got a thousand views, that was like a big video. Right, right, right. And so it was just, I did it because I loved it. And yeah, and it's just, I just stuck with it because it wasn't like I was getting into it because it was the trendy thing to do. Everybody's doing it. You can make a lot of money. It was just, I did it because it was the only thing that like kept me sane. Yeah. I enjoyed doing it. I could, I noticed that I could focus on that. Like in school, I wasn't great at focusing. So like I, I could saw i saw a lot of benefits yeah, yeah. from it yeah it's a great album. and yeah and it was also like 
I feel like video was my first kind of language, so to say, because I was a real shy, insecure kid growing up. Mm -hmm. It might not appear that way because I knew all those friends for so long, like growing up with them in like grade school and high school, whatever. So I was around them, so I felt comfortable and I, I was a very vocal person with all of them. Right. But around new people and strangers, I was very closed off. I didn't speak much, kept to myself. So video allowed me to kind of figure out what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it, and I could cut it together. And then once you had the final product, I could show it to people. And I, I noticed that I was connecting more with people ver with that language versus my actual words. Yeah. Um, and I just felt more natural at it. And I felt like I could construct and say what I wanted, what was on my mind. And one of like does the, it does the talking for you. Yeah. But then on top of it, what's cool is like when Rob walked into the room, chain smokers are doing the talking for you. Like yeah. your hype men are some of the biggest artists in the plant on the planet. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, no, Rory does this, he does this, you know what I mean? Like a manager. That's hilarious. But I think that is cool that to use that as a form of expression. And was that for the MTV show, uh, it does a season, which was sick to what like to see that actually happen. For you, when when the season ended, was it like you know if they were already cutting shows, were you like fuck? And the pressure's on to be able to like um, do a season two or what? How was that for you? Well, I I, I picked up pretty quickly that it probably wasn't going to do a second season because they never reran it. They ran it one time on the air date, and then it was a ter It wasn't a good time slot, and then yeah, there was no reruns of it. Mm. And like to like it's Typical weird. Shows always the thing that really pissed me off about that was I built like an Instagram following, like thirty or fifty thousand followers for the show, and then they changed it to like Black with No Cream, the Instagram handle. And I was like, wait, I never followed Black with No Cream. And then so that's how they market their new show. They basically just took my what? following, deleted all the posts, and rebranded it. So all of a sudden, you just are following some new show. Yeah, and like all my friends were like. Dude, what, what? I never followed this. And I was like, yo, I think they changed the handle. And like my friends like start piecing it together and they're like, oh, Weird. yeah. Damn, man. Yeah, I know. That's the tough part about that because it's like you kind of, you kind of did it at the end of the era, like to an extent, like this was the end of the era of television and the, and the magnitude of what that was. Rob ran the, the, the gauntlet, you know what I mean? Yep. Like, and then you got the taste of it, but the, hard part and i think that's why like if you i don't know if you like pay attention to casey neistat videos mm -hmm. like casey always talks about how like he did the hbo thing and he and he developed yep. this show and he put all his sweat and tears four years but then it would just linger because people all had their say and all this shit and then eventually he's like i just want to put my expression into these videos and upload it and have no one tell me i can't do that yeah and i think that that's always the battle is like which one's the right decision for me but honestly i feel like the feat of doing it in general and putting yourself through that and being able to attach artists to the show and be able to see your vision all the way through, like the fulfillment of just no, that shit existed. That's like the coolest shit ever. Yeah. Like, yeah, congrats, man. That was really Thank cool. You. When you, you know, when that show ends and d does that throw you off? Cause I know you talked to me before about like dealing with like your own kind of creative ruts and depression and, and dealing with that anxiety of, of creating all the time. And we're, I think we're always trained to just go, 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 go. You know I mean? Even the beginning of your career, like, yep. Oh, if I do this, I get two fifty. If I do this, I get some more money. If I do this, I get thousand like we're always chasing that yeah um w when did that kind of like play into your world and like how did you handle it like how did you handle dealing with like the creative like creative pressures or like the the ruts that would come i don't know if you've if you felt that but i remember yeah. you talking about something about um it. like after the tv show ended like i i was banking on it like going five six seasons right. and then like retiring or whatever or being financially stable where i don't have to worry about work or money um and that didn't happen and so when your dream since you're like 15 until it actually happens like at 32 like that's 17 years of like this is the end goal this is the end goal right. and then all of a sudden you you achieve your dream and you get to the end goal and then it's like well what's next mm. and i didn't know I didn't know, I didn't wanna like, I didn't wanna go back to shooting for artists all the time. I wanted to, you know, have this freedom that the show could hopefully provide for me. And so I freaked out, didn't know what was next and um, ended up getting in a car wreck and almost lost my life. Yeah. And 
then I went down pretty much rock bottom, ended up getting kicked out of my roommate's place at the time, and then moved into this one bedroom apartment in LA and just would wake up at like 6 a.m., have a black coffee and would read a book. And like, that was my life for a while. And like, I didn't want to create, didn't want to do anything. And um, it just felt like, it, if like for the first time, making videos and shooting like actually felt like work mm. and I didn't enjoy it. And it was like the magic seemed to be gone. And that's when also like everybody and their brother wanted to become a creator. And I was just like, well, dang, like everybody's doing it now. This ain't cool. And so, <laughs> yeah. but you know, I might have inspired. You started inspired, that fucking problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I might have inspired a bunch of people. I know I did. Yeah, you did. Um, and so it was it was weird to like go from this thing that was kind of like only mine and my friends like because I didn't know a lot of other if if you had a camera and you shot like we we were friends and right. it was like um, I didn't have a lot of those friends that actually owned cameras and shot and then over the last decade I feel like every one of my friends owns a camera now yeah, yeah, yeah. or everybody does I so, mean everybody does everybody's got like at least a phone yeah of course. Were you, I mean, in that moment, like when you were like, I'm in the apartment, I'm just reading books and just trying to, I'm just coasting right now. Was it you just being so turned off from like everything at that point or were people still trying to hit you up? Be like, Hey, we need you out here. We need you. You know, was that happening at the I, same time? Yeah. I had, um, actually I had my biggest job offer from, uh, Axe, the body spray. They wanted to like make you smell better. Yeah. So I did like a, a small campaign with them and then they wanted to do another one and it was a huge paycheck and I couldn't do it like just couldn't think I, about it I mean I I'm I'm very lucky in the sense of I'd signed a contract and like the day before the shoot I was like I can't do this like I think I'm having a mental breakdown and um yeah I just and like I was on the phone with them and they're like well you know you signed a contract and I was like I know I was like you know, if, if you have to take legal action, like I, I get it. I was like, I just, I can't do this. Right. And, um, and I, th I thought I could, and I was telling myself I could. And then it got to that point where I was like, I didn't, one, I, I just wasn't passionate about making videos. And two, I would have only been making that for the money. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's something I always told myself. It was like, never do it for the money because then it becomes a job. You're doing things that you don't like. You're like, so I said no and luckily they didn't take legal action they found somebody else to like do the campaign with and yeah did you feel like relief i mean obviously it's yeah. very difficult to like to have the conversations and deal with whatever the fuck they're saying i wish i would have said no from the beginning but yeah. like i yeah i felt this huge relief like in the sense of like i wasn't even i i was just envisioning me having a full blown panic attack while Honestly. we were supposed to be shooting yeah. and with people that I don't know. And I was just like, I don't, I don't want to be in that environment. Mm. And so didn't shoot for a while. And then, then I think one day I, uh, I made this, like this video I put on my, I actually just found it the other day. Um, it was a video. I basically have my mattress on the floor in my bedroom in this apartment. And like, there's this, the, the closet doors are all mirrors. Okay. And so I filmed this. Um, I got my 1DX Mark II on the glide cam, and you just see me wipe in front of the mirror, and you can see me holding the glide cam, and I'm like, the song comes on, and I just start going crazy, going, going yeah, yeah. To, to the beat of it, and I post it, and everybody's like, yo, this is sick. <laughs> like, what? And I was just like, and I started to have that itch again. Yeah. And so it was like, Cause I, I'd made that for me. Like, it wasn't like somebody told me to go, Hey, go film yourself in a mirror with your camera and like, make it look cool. Yeah. And so did it, posted it. And then just slowly started like getting back out there. Uh, met my, or reconnected with my wife, Amy that summer and we started dating. And then, um, Haley Bieber asked me to film her and Justin's wedding. And so like, that was a big, my first probably thing that I'd shot or worked on in a long time. And I like 
super grateful for her for asking me to like shoot that like huge moment. Yeah. Cause I feel like that gave me my second win, second chance to like where I'm at now. Jeez, man. Yeah. That's crazy too. Like, I think like you needing to discover love, you know what I mean? Yep. In the world of creativity, your personal life, like finding that balance and stuff. And then them having a big love moment and bringing you involved in that and you being able to facilitate that. It's pretty surreal, but I think that's important too that, and thanks for sharing all this shit. Yeah, this is like sure. really, this is awesome. people need to hear this type of shit. And I think that sometimes the weight can be so heavy and we like push through it and you're not satisfied. Like say you did the ax campaign, you finished the job and whatever, you got the money, but no matter, like you're just completely stressed out or you just put yourself through some emotional shit that no one really will know about. But is that, what's the benefit there for you? You know what I mean? Right. And especially when you, this became art, artful, like the whole point of this thing was for you to have some sort of outlet for your art. And I think a lot of people then to turn it into business. And of course, business comes with like, how do we keep getting more money? And yep. then you see the YouTube videos, how oh, I made a hundred K in five minutes. And you know what I mean? And like everyone yeah. wants that, they want that shit, but being real with yourself and being able to take a step back and being able to find you, you know what I mean? Like who knows what you soaked up in those books? Who knows yeah. what you soaked, soaked up in solitude? You know what I mean? I don't know why the mattress on the floor or whatever you were looking at that moment, but you were just, you, then it just turned on and you saw some something yeah. and just pulled it out. Again. I read some good books during that time. I read, uh, the Steve jobs autobiography. Mm. That was amazing. And then I read a book called unfuck yourself. Okay. Yeah. And then I, I think I was, Two, bu two books in two months. And yeah. I was like, yo, I'm going to read tw 12 books this year. <laughs> yeah. And then I didn't read any more. Yeah, stopped that. immediately. You're like, then you picked up the yep. character. You're yep. like, never mind. This is tight. Yep. Um, so, you know, when you did that, how, had you you had already had like quite a, a journey with Bieber before that, right? Before you shot the wedding? Yep. That that was going on during that tur duration, I guess, prior to the show? Yeah. It was that, that point so I was too. Like when I was doing my TV show, I was juggling, working with Bieber, Chainsmokers, and making a TV show. Insane. It was crazy. That's literally insane. Um, yeah. So after, the, I mean, at the wedding, like getting to capture that, um, how, what was the approach for that? Because it's funny because you did, there's always like the two types of creative people, right? And there's so many of them that just, they create businesses around wedding videography and stuff, right? You weren't doing that, but that's how most people like are getting started doing that. You've been touring and doing all this art stuff. So what was your like approach to capturing the wedding? Was it just you flying the wall? Were you trying to like actually capture it? Like with the, I'm just thinking like, it's an interesting way to get back into things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so he was, that was the first time that he, so it was Haley's idea. So Justin made Haley ask me and then Justin got involved and he's like, yo, like you can, bring some friends to help shoot. Like, I want to make it sick. And I was like, all right. So like, that was the first time I was able to bring in anyone outside of his camp into that camp. Mm. And I brought my friend Evan yep. in and, uh, shout out to this kid, by the way, yeah. you, the growth just from seeing him through your stuff too is ridiculous. Yeah. He's, he's, he's the man. He, uh, met him in Hawaii on a Tim Sykes trip and Tim Sykes was like, dude, this guy loves your videos. He's a big fan of yours. And like, and I saw a lot of myself in Evan mm -hmm. in the sense of like, he went mute, didn't really say anything. And I was like, oh, this is me. This is me. <laughs> and uh, so we just became friends and he was like, yo, like I wanna help you with your videos. And he was helping me with all my brand stuff. He was supposed to help me on that act shoot. And um, so I was like, hey, you wanna help me film Beaver's Wedding? And he was like, yeah. So he helped me with that. Um, and then fast forward, like he was always the person I was able to, hey, can I bring a second shooter to this shoot? And it's like, yeah. I was like, cool. Is it cool if I bring Evan? Right. And then I ended up, um, uh, before the Justice Tour started, uh, one of the sponsors was T-Mobile and they wanted to do this fan cam before the show every night where you go on stage and like basically take, it's like 40 or 50 pictures and they stitch them all together. Okay. So you're shooting at like a 15 for the front row and then you're shooting with, the 200 for the back row and they stitch it together and you can zoom in and it's it's sick right it's actually really cool but i was like yo there's you want me to do that after Jaden, before justin i was like that's like when justin comes out does his prayer like i was like i need to be there capturing that i can't do that right and they're like well like so they're like well how do we do this we're like we'll just maybe we'll bring a guy out and i was like that's That'll that's never, never gonna happen yeah so i suggested well, what about evan so evan and like, I don't even think Justin knew this till like, he didn't even know he was coming till like 
he just randomly saw him on tour. Um, <laughs> but so basically I got Evan on the tour through T-Mobile. So T -Mo so Justin didn't pay. T-Mobile covered it. T-Mobile covered it for the fan cam. Right. And so then on top of that, then I got a second shooter. Right. For free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah. And then you guys are just double down on like making, which probably makes it a little bit, I, I I know this. From, I had done a tour by myself, and then I had done a tour with Dave wherever he's at. And like us going in tandem was like the best thing ever because we were able to not have to like kill ourselves for the entire day. We could like take certain roles ourselves or whatever, make sure we're getting everything covered. But yep. um, yeah, did that alleviate some tour stress? I guess or make yeah, it a little well, easier? it's just like it, it allowed me to think bigger. Mm. You know, it wasn't just me. It was like, hey, now I can like I want you covering this while I focus on this. Right, and it was like before. Um, I was only working for Justin, right? And it wasn't like I'd responsible for shooting the band, the dancers. He's got a big camp, right? And I would shoot all these people and like deliver photos and like you know go above and beyond. And then with Evan on there, it allowed me to focus on the bigger picture, where I could be like, "Hey, you just do your thing. You you shoot the dancers tonight. You get all them." So that way, and the reason I wanted to shoot all them is because I wanted everybody on the team to be like having content and like you know they're all superstars yeah, exactly yeah. that's hilarious so, that's literally what I mean Dave did with Beyonce's tour and the, yeah because it, it was that it was like and everyone's so cool and they all need their spotlight too and but you doing it by yourself man you got to go back and you're trying to get all the best shots of Justin plus all all right now I got like 10,000 photos I'm like trying to go through by myself but yep. being able to divide and conquer it helps a lot was it at the same time when you guys were growing that um can we circle back to you getting the cover art yeah Cause that was, that shit turned out so good. Thanks. When you were doing, were you, did you know that that's what you were chasing for when you were, when you were, was that shoot specifically for the album? Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah, it was it like was the album packaging that. shoot. Yep. Yeah. So was that your first album cover? Yeah. Can you walk me through that? Yeah. So I think it was like 20, 2013 or something. I just, I was journaling and I wrote in my journal, like one day I want to shoot an album cover. Mm. And I wrote like. Nirvana, Nevermind, a bunch of examples of like iconic. I I knew it couldn't be like a graphic design one because I wasn't great at graphic design. So I knew it was going to have to be like an actual image yeah. of some sort. And so um, we'd filmed, uh, Justin did a New Year's Eve show on top of the Beverly Hilton. And uh, we did a doc out of it called Our World. I brought a bunch of outside people in to help yeah, do yeah. that. And then I think it was like, January like first or something like just one of Justin's managers, Allison, texts me and was like, "Hey, he wants you to shoot the album packaging." And I'm just like, "Wait, what?" So I get on a call with Justin. He goes over like the vision for it, like what he wants, um, like motorcycle, grungy '90s vibe, um, kind of like uh, the Place Beyond the Pines mm, right. of um, Ryan Gosling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was like a huge inspiration for like the aesthetic, the look. Um, and so I called up my buddy, Javi, who, uh, I met out here, but we both went to the same college, didn't know each other in college. He produced it. I told him I want like three locations. I was like, you know, like it's going to be about like this guy on a bike. Uh, we, I want to have like a garage like s set up. So we had like a garage scene with all this motorcycle stuff. We shot in the LA river for location two. And then we shut down, I think it's the second. Second or third street tunnel. There's two tunnels down yeah, there. Yeah, I yeah. forget which one is which, but we the, we shut down the the bigger one. The, did you modify the lights in there? No. So the lights in there they had, they looked different at one point, and they I think they removed these covers, mm. and so it ended up yeah it was a different look than normally right. what's there. Um. So yeah, we just shot these three locations and um literally captured the the cover probably in the last hundred images. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah, I was just ripping away on the, I think I, I think I shot the 5D Mark IV that day just because it had a bigger megapic, megapic, yeah, yeah. Megal, Megal, megapixel, megapixel. <gasps> um, yeah, and we, I, we threw on the eight to 15 fisheye and it snagged was... it. And then the best part about that, uh, I went home that night and I like went through like basically deleted all the out of focus, any garbage. And then the next day I was like, well, I'm gonna have to go through, you know, a couple thousand selects and this is gonna be a process. Right. And Justin calls me, he's like, hey, do you wanna come over and like go through the photos? And I was like, yes. Just doing it with him. Yeah, so, so he, I was like, 
So you just press this P button, it flags it. <laughs> yeah. So he'd go through and be like, boom, boom. And then he's like, this is the cover. And he like got up and like ran around and he's like, Haley, you guys see this? And I was like, oh my God. It like, was the end that, that was the one. Dude, he pulled your selects for you. That's the yeah. best in the world. It was so awesome so having him do the selects. <laughs> so much time. That's so dope. What What do you feel like was like one thing that you learned on that shoot that you would give to another photographer that's going to go into like a high pressure moment like that? Like dealing with talent, having to like be on your toes, be prepared. Were you, I don't know why I suggest what that the tip might be. I was what do you think was the it tip? Mood what do you boards? Think the, was you, it was it like going? Were you were you doing no? I think I think uh, it would be to take a moment in for yourself and like that was we were I could walk you to the exact spot he was standing and I was standing. We were shooting the bike in front of this garage in um, in this back alley in Venice, and um, I'm just doing my thing. I'm just in the zone, and he goes, "Hey, make sh be sure to take a moment in for yourself today." Justin and, said that. Yeah, and I was like, "Whoa." And it made me like step back and I was just like, you're right. Like yeah. everything, if I really think about it, all my memories are from the camera point of view. Like when you watch your footage back, that becomes my memory, right. not like me holding the camera. Yeah. And so it allowed me to just step back and be like, wow, like all my friends are the crew. Um, this, uh, this, it, it just sort of allowed me to appreciate everything, to slow down, take in those moments and like, yeah, it was so cool. My yeah. wife came to the third location where we, uh, to the tunnel and. Oh, she was there when you got the, yeah, the shot. It was so funny because like we were driving down there and we'd just gotten this little puppy, Fira. And so we brought her and we get you down. Did this. Yeah. <laughs> you just cradled this little dog. Yeah. <laughs> and so we get down there and she's like, oh, like this is like a legit shoot. And I was like, <laughs> I go, what do, you th what do you think we were doing? Like dodging yeah. traffic? Yeah. And she was like, I was like, this is Bieber. We're not yeah, like, yeah, yeah. we don't have to cheat, messing around. steal shots and stuff. Yeah. And so she was like, I didn't realize you were like shutting down the tunnel and like had like police on. Cops, yeah. yeah. And I was like, yeah, this is, it's legit. I She's was like, like I, think I was I, like, your husband <laughs> yeah. kind of a, kind of doing something <laughs> yeah. with his life. And uh, so that was a cool moment. That's crazy, yeah. man. And I think part of it comes to like the family, this like family brother relationship that you've developed. Not, I mean, with Bieber too, like his ability to trust you. But I feel like you do that with the, everyone you meet. Like you make everyone feel like family, or you've, well, you. Well, that's know. the thing. Is like, I gotten I've gotten offers to work with like artists, and now, now I only want to work with people that like I either want to be around or I enjoy their stuff. Because mm -hmm. like. I don't want it to be a job. I don't want to like feel like I'm working, and so yeah, that's yeah. No, it's 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 important too because you don't want to get put in that part, that spot again where it's like it just forces you to feel like you're not being creative for what you came here for. But it is it is interesting how the trust factor can open up the doors where to be on set. Think about that. Like when you're the artist and you're employing a whole crew of people, and their job is to make you look insane. And for that person to tell you, like, hey, take a moment for yourself. Yeah. That's pretty surreal. You know what I mean? To have someone care in that in their biggest moment of just, you know, whatever this is to them to tell to remind you to take your moment. I don't know. I just think that comes from you being able to really tap into love with people and like be able to make that and it it just opens the door for creativity and, and flourishing. I don't really know where I'm going with that, but no, that's I really think cool. I attribute a lot of it uh, to the way I was raised. Like my parents like just like how to treat people and whatnot and Yeah. Yeah the the craziest shit i mean obviously you've been touring nonstop. I, I know the tour wasn't exactly how it was supposed to go because the tour was supposed to be like till really long like, till march next march which would have been what over a year a little over a year a full year yeah. world tour um which he has some issues so you guys paused the tour and then i think it started again but then stopped again so you got but you still did a shit ton of shows like, yeah i think we did 50 50 some shows you slacklined at one or whatever that's oh, zip called. Zipline? Zipline. Yeah. You ziplined. Oh, my God. What the fuck was that? So, basically, we got there, and somebody was like, yo, they got a zipline over the crowd. And I was like... Pfft. Yeah. I was like... I'll do they it. Won't let me, they wouldn't let us fly drones. So, I was like, here's my drone shot. Yeah. So, I go over there, and I meet... Like, we had, like, three, four hours to kill before Justin even showed up. Mm -hmm. So, I go over, and I was like, hey, here's my credentials. I work for Justin. I'm his videographer, photographer. Uh, I was like, is it possible to... Like, I'll put a strap on everything, and, like, zip line with my camera and they're like okay and i was like i'm gonna come here's the set list i'm gonna come during holy i want this shot and so i come over there they're like we got the harness and they like suit me up and they like, run me up the stairs and i was like 
the guy's like, okay. And I was like, dude, I got it from here. Okay, just <laughs> yeah. chill. And so I'm like waiting for that. Oh God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it so just I just start zipping down yeah, was and so I funny. was, and they didn't let anybody do it during the show. So I was the only person during the show and my buddy gets this like little clip on his phone and you just hear him laughing. I know it's the funniest shit I've ever seen. Yeah. Cause I was like, yo, what is he doing? <laughs> and then apparently a bunch of fans recognize me in that. Yeah, I'm sure they did. To, like, and they were all like, yo, there yeah, goes Rory. And I was like, yo, <laughs> this is crazy. Moment. What do you, what do you feel like you, you get the most from tour? Like what, do, what are some of your favorite aspects of being on the road or being in that, you know, consistent environment? Cause a lot of times I'm sure the challenge is how do I make it look different after you shot 50 shows? Um, I think my favorite part about touring is probably just being in a, like a, a good routine, mm. um, sleeping in good beds, like at hotels, access to gyms, uh, good food. So I, I, yeah, I feel like, I don't know where I'm going with this. The repetition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. Like I, I like yeah, the routine of yeah. it and just having something for my mind to focus on rather yeah. than like letting it wander because that sometimes is dangerous. Right. It's the awesome. I, Obviously, there's, there's a million stories that I know you could tell and I, I appreciate you for literally being vulnerable on this podcast and being willing to open up because I'm telling you, man, people are going to feel that at home and, and be able to relate. Appreciate myself the included. opportunity. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thanks. I know Canon made this happen. Um, we're about to go to ComplexCon together and be on a Let's panel, go. which is cool. I don't know if you'll be able to watch that, hopefully. I know they were filming it, but it'd be cool if that comes up. Yeah. But yeah, dude, thanks for doing this. Yeah, I Thank you. So before we end it, this is how okay. I do it. I almost forgot my own thing. I'm going to tell you, you have to pick a hashtag, okay? So you're going to pick a hashtag, and what I'm going to do is have everyone that's listening go to your Instagram, whatever the latest post, whenever they're hearing this, they're going to go put this hashtag, they're going to tag me, at Ben Reverse World, and then you and I will both know that someone listened to the whole episode all the way through. Okay. It can be whatever you want, and I can't help you. I think I'm just going to have to go with hashtag run it. Run it? Yeah. Is it? But run it's the brand, which by the yeah. way, we didn't really talk about it. Yeah. You've, you've blown that thing up. It's crazy. And uh, I think like Bieber helped like, like inspire me where like he was, he was always saying, I was like, don't be stealing my thing. He goes, what if it's next YOLO? And I was like, well, keep saying it, brother. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, like that was just something that I created to help push past my own fears. Mm. It was like, it's like, before the moment you actually do something. So like, let's say I was just going to throw this cup. Like, you know, I might be debating it in my head. Like, oh, is this going to stay, like the coffee going to stay in the carpet? And then all of a sudden you get to that fuck it point yeah. where you're just like, run it. Yeah, Once yeah. I say run it, then it's, there's no Commitment. backing out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I love that. Yeah, yeah it's about just facing your own fears. All right, cool. You guys heard it. Put it, do it. It's uh, it's an honor, man. Appreciate you, bro. Dude, thank you very much. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Hell yeah. Wee! Let's go. Man, that was fun.